Hey everybody, P. Day Turner, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show with another fantastic episode. Hey, you know how we like to get into the modern combat uh, and explaining the tactics, the theory, all the different aspects of that. And today's another one of those episodes. Now, yesterday we had on Major John Spencer, who's retired, works for West Point's Modern Warfare Institute, and we talked a lot about how uh, training police you know, how that, how that went for us and how that might look here in the States and the complexities therein. Well, today he's back again. And this time he's, he's brought with him a friend, Dr. Colonel Liam Collins. And what, uh, what we all talk about this time is more about like these, this, the different aspects of modern combat. Now, you know, I'm going to talk about the people because that's what I always deal with. But when you look at all the different things, like, for example, it's not a lot of training. If you see a drone in a combat zone and it's not yours, what do you do? Well, we don't really train on that. Uh, how do we deal with the fact that we can more easily, and which means they can more easily determine where electronic signals come from? So if you have a command center, if you have a bunch of laptops turned on, that can be seen on the electric magnetic, magnetic spectrum. So, uh, you know, that means that you can target that and do something to it. So what do you do about that? All these different aspects of the fight that we may or may not have. We also kind of get into how grisly a civil war looks like these days by talking about the Ukraine and what's been going on there with Russia. It's pretty heavy stuff, pretty heady stuff. And I know you're going to be interested in it because you guys are fascinated with what I'm fascinated by. So I know you'll love Liam and John and I. And we'll probably get right back to it and do another one of these things. We've done a little bit of this military exploration recently because we've had some uh, very intelligent minds available. And so I'm like, hey, let's do it. But there's always something new on the Break It Down show. And if you're new at all to the show and you're listening for the first time, five at least five episodes a week this is a podcast audio version of uh, of a live episode we did earlier all all of the live episodes are available on the youtube channel but if you're new five episodes you might hear musicians you might hear phds talking on a variety of topics history whatever it is we keep it really broad and loose and i th- think you'll like it all right enough about that save the brave save the brave.org you know what to do there help us out we uh, we will put that money to work and other than that here comes liam here comes john Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copa. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, I'm Liam Collins, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, so one of the things we like to do around here is examine uh, modern combat in all of its forms and functions, and and that that stuff that stuff seems to move around. Now we've had John Spencer on the show before, so he's sort of co-hosting slash guesting with me as we fellas as we try to get our hands wrapped around this. There's a lot of conflict in the world all the time. We don't pay attention to a lot of it. Um, we have a lot of small conflict here, I guess you would say. Um, and I also noticed a, a, a desire to get to some kind of state of civil war here in the U.S. But I think before we get there, I think it would be good for us to spend some time in the conflicts that we do have going on. You know, for example, in uh, Ukraine and Russia and other areas where, you know, what modern combat is, is moving forward in terms of a, uh, a martial art, a practice or whatever it's going to be. So that's sort of the premise I'd like to stick within. But let's also feel free to range out and and not miss a mark if something important is out there. What do you guys say? That sounds good. Let's do it. So, Liam, give us a little bit of your background since you're new to the show. I want to make sure everybody has a chance to understand who you are, and what you do. Oh, boy. Okay. So, um, yeah, I spent a uh, career special forces officer, um, spent time in uh, Afghanistan early on, first start, start of the war, and in Iraq at the start of the war there as well, some time in the uh, Balkans in the late 90s, supporting the air war in Kosovo. Uh, then went to graduate school at Princeton, got my master's and PhD, then went up to West Point and was the director of the Combating Terrorism Center up there, and then uh, the director, uh, founding director of the Modern War Institute. Genesis to you know study study contemporary conflict because we just didn't have a good understanding of it in the, in the military. What do you understand contemporary conflict as? Well, when we look when we kind of look at it, I you know I would say probably you know look at the last twenty years or so, right? If you want to have a good understanding of what uh, warfare is going to be like in the future, I mean, 
you got to at least understand what it is in the present. And, you know, the, the military, right. You always hear that saying, you know, people fight the last war that that's not always the case. It, 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 it you know, I think what, um, but, but you want to have some understanding of it and, 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 and to be able to anticipate how things might go, because you're never going to get it right, but you want to be as wrong as, you know, as close to it as possible, right. Be, be, be wrong just a little bit, not, not in a grand scheme of things. So if you really look at it, I mean, You've got, um, you know, you can look at Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Donbass, right? So, uh, you know, if, if you look broadly across the spectrum, you know, you, you, you've seen the terms, you know, new generation warfare, Russian hybrid warfare, gray zone warfare. But that's kind of, I mean, at least what the what the Russians are kind of operating at today. They're trying to operate at a level bo- below what constitute an act of war, uh, to, to promote their national objectives and to, be, to, to accomplish what they want to. And then how do you define terrorism since you have a background in it and everybody seems to have a different definition? Let's, what's yours? Oh boy. Yeah. I mean, so <laughs> what you look at is, right, it's, it's the act of violence or threat of violence, you know, for political purposes uh, against non-combatants. Those are really kind of, you know, there's no, you know, single definition, but that's typically what, what, what it includes, right? Violence or the threat of violence, Right for political purposes, and uh, right, and typically against what we would say is non-combatants. Right, and a lot of times that violence is instrumental, meaning the the victim of the violence really isn't your intended audience. Right, it's the broader uh, public uh, uh, or or or, or re- representatives, you know, elected officials, whatever it is. Right, that's kind of the target of that violence, not necessarily, you know, those who suffer the violence. And John, what about you? Modern conflict, how do you define it? Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you gave those softballs to Colonel <laughs> Collins. Um, I mean, I, I, what he said, no, but so we struggle with this, right? Um, well, you, can you draw a line in the sand and say, you know, Vietnam, modern conflict, or do you draw, you know, a post telecommunications revolution, a post global positioning system revolutions and technologies that are often you know attributed to lines in the sand when we talk about you know post-industrial revolution and post telecommunic you know these lines in the sand are, are kind of different phases in the what we say the character of warfare so I, I usually like to lean towards that when I talk about modern warfare I'm talking really some of these after these after the industrial revolution so really post Vietnam kind of operations in, in across the world. Yeah. And as John is saying, right, with some of those changes that you see, think of like, right, you know, back in the 1900s, talking about terrorism, right, it was okay, a stick of dynamite or something, right? That was it. Um, and so what, what you have is really the, the proliferation of, right, the means of violence, right? Arms and ammunition, right, can be found pretty much anywhere in the world or brought there, right, through modern shipping and anything else. So it's easy to get the means of violence, or you can just, right, go to the internet, get the information and, and build a bomb in your kitchen, right? And so the ability for an individual, right, or a group of individuals to now inflict, right, significant violence is much greater. So you have the democratization of violence, right? And the and states have lost kind of that monopoly of violence, the ability to control. Uh, and, and so you have that. And so it's the sharing information, right? The ability of, you know, previously, if you were just a lone actor, right? It's a lot of people aren't gonna act on their own, like true lone wolves, right? They're the exception. But now you can bring a bunch of, you know, relatively small, radicalized individuals, but it's easier for them to bring come together, right? They can see that there's other people that feel their same way, and it allows them to kind of act on it in a way that they probably couldn't have in the past. And they can get together a lot easier than they could in the past, either virtually or physically, because of, right, you can get anywhere in the world fairly easily. Yeah, truly, modern combat has been democratized. You know, and, and I know you used this example with John before, but you can literally go on to Amazon right now and buy a drone that has a 100 pound or greater payload and fly that thing just about wherever you want and detonate whatever you want to carry from it. I mean, anybody can do that and and cause a lot of a, a lot of distress and obviously tragedy. The other thing I think, too, is important to remember is I don't know that you have to take credit for this stuff anymore. If you're just looking to delegitimize, destabilize you know, um, this this recent explosion at the shipping dock in, uh, in Lebanon, we we don't we don't know. I mean, we have ideas. There's some thoughts, but ultimately, if it was just an accident, okay. But 
if it wasn't, you don't have to take credit for it. Like there is significant reaction to that, you know, and I, I, those, those information aspects of modern conflict are there as well. Yeah, without a doubt. And, and, and kind of going back again to kind of the democratization of violence and kind of why is the modern era, you know, why do we say, hey, this modern period is unique or what is it changed from before? You know, going back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, right? A lot of technology originated with NASA, right? The U.S. military, right? A lot of innovation, technological innovation started there. Now we are lagging in that, right? We get it from the right uh, commercial sector, right? They're the ones. And before, right, the, the lag, right, our, our advantage, technological advantage over our adversaries was measured in years, right? And, and, and as late as 2003, when I was in Iraq, um, we were working with British, right, their elite unit. And, and we were doing a combined operation. And, and I was talking to one of their commanders. And he's like, hey, I can give you, you know, 10 guys tonight or I can give you 25 tomorrow. And I'm like, 25 to, you, you've got everybody here. What are they doing? And he said, we, not everybody has night vision goggles. We only have like one for every three guys. We're getting all of them from the rear sent forward. And I'm like, this is 2003. You're the elite unit in the UK and you don't have them. When I was a platoon leader in the 82nd in 1993, 10 years earlier, right? My lowliest private, every single person had night vision goggles, right? So, you know, our advantage was like, you know, years or a decade. And now that's shrunk to the point now where, like you said, um, right, especially in, when you're talking information operations, cyber, these things, right, it's no longer, we, we may not even have an advantage anymore. It's pretty level or, or some of our adversaries have, you know, some, some, some unique advantages. And so, right, it really has uh, transformed how you have to think about it. John? Yeah, so there's a lot there. And, and you know, Pete, as we get in these conversations and how, how many different directions it can take when we're talking about, I mean, are we talking about nation state capabilities to wage war? Are we talking about the super empowered individual that's just a bad person and that wants to do bad things, but not necessarily falls under the definition of war or terrorism um, because they have no political objective. They, they have no cause. They have no national interest. Sometimes, when we see this democratization of capabilities, like you said, off the shelf drones, although sometimes you still need a military capability with that, right? Because most of the times they're dropping grenades or a military ammunition or something like that off of those things, despite uh, homemade explosive capabilities. You know, it's really hard, especially if you're teaching about this stuff, to draw the line between, okay, that's terrorism, that's war. Or that's and that's why hybrid, I think, warfare starts to get really tricky because you have, you know, a, a full cauldron of capabilities where you have nation states that are employing proxy forces that are, you know, maybe then the proxy forces are working with criminals that are just, again, tr like you said, trying to just destabilize the region, the world, whatever it is. When we start talking about these definitions and these particulars to the modern world you start to see some very different things than in the past because, you know, historians will say, you know, none of this stuff is new, right? None of this. It's all that I can point to time when, you know, when this happened, that happened, you know, all, but we argue strongly that there's not only a difference in the modern age, but it's not necessarily as understood. And like Liam said, some nations don't have, we don't follow the same you know, just moral rules or laws of conflict to where, although they may have a, an advantage, it's just not an advantage that we're going to pursue. When we talk about being prepared and uh, Liam, you were talking about like, you know, training up for war. One of the things that I've asked a lot of my operator friends. And so I'll ask you as the first part of this long ass question that's about to happen, but uh, I've discovered that most operators say that they've had more conversations in conflict zones than they fire bullets. Is that true for you? Yeah. I mean, that's true for, for, for me as well, but I mean, you got to keep in mind prob probably going, you go back to world war two and things like that. I mean, Right. It's it's right. Short periods of intense violence. Right. And then either a lot of sitting around doing nothing or engaging with the locals. Right. And in, in Afghanistan and in, in Iraq, we're more of, you know, a counterinsurgency. So you've got the ratio is going to be different that way. But, you know, don't forget that in, in conflict. Right. It's it's yeah. Short periods of intense violence. You know, even in World War Two and 
we're World War One with the trenches, right? It's just a lot of sitting around in trenches and then you know, short periods of intense conflict. Yeah, but we don't train like that's the fight. We train like, uh, you know, tankers go tank and uh, artillery men go out and they fire artillery and then literally never fire their artillery piece once while deployed other than maybe it's a practice. So when, when we're trying to prepare, I would suggest that we don't even prepare at a rate of 50% of, of what the fight is. I mean, yes, intense conflict, you know, how do you respond to an IED with an ambush attack attached after it? But, you know, look, I went to a pre, pre-combat deployment training and their training was every culvert you stopped and you had someone come out and inspect the culvert. And if there was a bomb, then you called for EOD. And I'm like, that's not how we do this. You know, if there's a culvert, maybe you post someone ahead, but Michael, you just drive over that thing because you got to get somewhere, you know? And so our training from my experience specifically was rarely on task. It was, it was good military training, but almost completely irrelevant for the fights that I saw. Yeah. And I would say, I mean, you don't want to not train, right? You've got to be trained for the highest risk mission, not necessarily the highest probability. The problem with the military is, right, we we do a historically, we do a terrible job of balancing that right. We train 100 percent, you know, prior to Iraq and Afghanistan, we train 100 percent of our effort. I'm exaggerating slightly, but not much, right, for a high intensity conventional conflict and spend almost no time on the, on anything else, right? And, and we, and it's not just we don't train, right? We we, we, we shun it. We look down upon it. It's lower, I mean, you know, operations other than war, right? One of the worst terms we ever had, you know, now, okay, stability operations, right? It's, it's kind of given a lower class, even though it's a much harder operation to do. Um, and so if you would look, right, we did a really, really good job seizing Baghdad, you know, in the first three weeks. But if we would have you know, trained and really understood what, right, what stability operations are, then maybe we would have been a little less trained on the front end and maybe lost a few more lives, but we would have, you know, saved many more down the road because we wouldn't have done the, the infamous, right, CPA orders one and two, you know, it, because we just had no intellectual understanding or we would, maybe would have convinced our leaders not to even go to Iraq in the first place because, Right. This is what it can lead to. And maybe we don't even want to go. But we just we haven't learned those lessons. We're still now right. We're pivoting back to multi-domain operations, you know, not quite as bad as the post-Vietnam era where we we basically shunned counterinsurgency. And we basically told our elected officials, we can't we don't want to do this. And to make sure we'll never do it, we will be completely untrained for it and unprepared for it, uh, which is a good strategy until you have to do it. And so we're kind of going back in that direction again. And yet you talk to everybody that went and did it. They were the best at it. <laughs> That's the best part. You see all the chaos and you're like, no, but, but we were the exception. We did a great job. Uh, the other thing I want to bring in is in, in this, uh, and, and again, multi-domain war is really no different than, than UTWA, you know, like the operations other than war. It's just a nonsensical term that can mean anything you want it to mean. And you still get to, to feed your baby and say everybody else's baby is dumb. Um, I was in Iraq talking to a general and we had had, you know, very good, solid rapport. This is our 100th meeting or whatever it was. It was a uh, election campaign time. And so there were a number of guys running and one guy had been targeted. We saw it in the Intel reports. We saw it in the action in town and uh, they didn't want him to run and he didn't get the message. And so one day someone planted a bomb in like the front of his house and it went boom when he wasn't home. And so doing my job, I asked the general, I'm like, what does all this mean? Like, what, you know, what is the problem with this guy? And the guy just, he smokes a cigarette and he says, it is politics. <laughs> if they wanted him to die, they would have killed him. They, they like him. They just don't want him to run. He shouldn't run if he wants to stay alive. So when you look at conflict, it even goes into, and I think we're starting to see some of that here in the U.S., you know, the political part of it, where it can be a form of communication. We don't want you to do this. Don't force us to kill you. But we will kill you if you keep doing this. Yeah, I mean, without a doubt, I mean, right, politics, I mean, you're fighting war for political purposes, or at least should be, right? And we kind of, we, we, we too often kind of try to separate that and make them two distinct things. But, right, ultimately, right, that's the purpose of it, just like we talked about terrorism at the beginning, right? The whole purpose of it 
is not just some kind of complete r- radical lunatic, right? I mean, right? They have a political agenda of what they're trying to accomplish. They're just coming about it from a radical perspective. They might have radical beliefs, but right, ultimately it's for p- politics, right? Otherwise, they'd be a sociopath with mo- with which they generally, you know, by and large, aren't, right? And, right. and so, yeah, it, it's kind of understanding that. And like you said, we just don't do a good job of kind of intellectually preparing our our our, our officers and our you know in the military for that because we kind of have a a way that we train and educate right and 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 right if you can't go and do it in the field if you can't simulate it on a computer then it doesn't really fit our kind of the way our institutional our organizational norm is um, it's hard to simulate counterinsurgency and we don't want to do it anyway so because it's hard. And, and so let's just not even do it. And mm-hmm. let's, let's just be really good at, at one thing. So in terms of like risk mitigation, really good at mitigating one kind of risk, right? If it's a conventional conflict, we're, we're pretty good at it probably, but uh, anything else we're going to be in, we, you know, it, we're a little bit more challenged. John, before I let you respond to that, I want to jump into and say, as a spy, my pre-deployment training was terrible. We didn't know what we were going to do. We didn't get. We didn't learn how to how to build networks and you know how to influence and build trust. We learned how to do alert, assemble, upload, winter driving techniques, you know, staying warm. That's the stuff we trained on. And so, so when I deploy and I attach to to your infantry battalion or or your you know your special forces you know ODAs, you know, it's on me to have developed myself. And, and again, like that's, I think that's through a lot of the support branches where there are too many things to master in terms of keeping yourself alive and provisioned that you don't have time to really de- dedicate true, like, you, you know, the regular army never shoots. I mean, relatively speaking to the rest of the world that we shoot a lot, but, you know, a couple hundred rounds a year, maybe, you know, and to develop any kind of proficiency for combat, I, I would suggest you need more than that. So, so we really don't do a good job of training for, for the we kind of spread it around, I guess, where the, where the money is and where the commander's interest is, you know, and it's not very effective. John, your comments on this overall concept. Well, I started with some units get to shoot a little bit more than that because they have a different budget. Sure. Yeah, I don't know about John or you. I didn't do any, I never did pre-deployment training in my life because we trained for war every day. We didn't, yeah. we didn't prep when war came. We, we trained our butts off yeah. all the time. So I, I knew that, you know, talking with Liam and the lights are going off on that's just not, you know, but we know there's a distinction and there's a tier system and there's, yeah, there's differences in units and everything. But I mean, back to this training for the war you're actually in or training for the war you believe you're going to fight. So there's all this, any military, and I see it across the world, trains their militaries in the highest risk situations and what they think their military should be used for right so even in these new age of multi-domain operations back to near peer adversary um you go out to the biggest training events in the world and you'll see them like you said tank on tank 90 percent of the scenarios are going to be against an enemy force maybe a peer force on a sterile battlefield um and and that's just not modern warfare, and that's you know, why we continue to say it. Um, so there's many reasons on why that is, why we keep training for this sterile battlefield. Even if you believe you're not going to be fighting proxy forces and terrorists amongst the people, if you don't believe that, which is wrong to think that, um, there's just no sterile parts of the world. They're disappearing, as you know, I say. I mean, it's going to be really hard to find these sterile pieces of ground where it's going to be a big tank battle. Um, that aren't going to be a lot of civilians in a way, or there won't be all these other aspects to the to the fight, the information campaign. The, I mean, Liam could tell you some stories uh, uh, along the U- Ukraine border of uh, you know, this massive efforts of you don't call it fighting, but information warfare, where you know soldiers and families are receiving texts from the other side and. I mean, it's all a different type of war, but we, we seem to be stuck, even if we're not even, you know, let's take counterinsurgency off off the table and, and get all, I, you and I have talked in detail on why people resist that. And let's even take not even training for Af- Iraq and Afghanistan counterinsurgency operations. You go out and watch somebody train for force on force today. 
I mean, th- th- there's no people present. <laughs> I mean, it's literally like you say, you you separate the two forces and say go, and then they meet in the middle and they fight it out against their capabilities. But that's just not modern war. That's not how it's going to happen. There's so many environmental things that are present that are important as the ability to see an enemy and destroy it or all these other aspects of modern combat that we know are present, but they're really hard to replicate in any training event. But that doesn't mean they shouldn't be trying. Yeah. And and, right. Talking about the tank on tank, right? I mean, most of our adversaries looked what happened in the first Gulf war. They're not dumb enough to fight us in an open desert with tanks. Right. I mean, you know, what was it probably 20 years ago, you know, asymmetric warfare became a term, right? And everybody was throwing it around like it's something, a dirty term, right? Kind of like anti-access area denial, right? They kind of using it kind of a negative connotation now, right? That's smart warfare, right? What, why the heck would anybody want to fight symmetrically? Look at World War One and World War Two, right? Those are slugfests. The last thing you want to do is fight symmetrically, right? But so our asymmetry is we can outspend everybody and have greater technology. So then others are going to look to defeat that. They aren't going to fight it. You know, most aren't going to want to fight in a mass force where we can leverage those advantage, right? So they're going to sever our communications, which we're completely dependent on, right? Show me how many lieutenants can go out there and navigate without a GPS now, right? Probably not that many. They're not that good at it because they haven't had to do it, right? When we grew up, I, I use the analogy John knows, but when, when all of us grew up as kids and you're going across the country on a trip, right? You got, you got your atlas and you're just looking at it, you know, navigating in two dimensions, well, now all you got is like, a, you know, a, this is what's navigating. You have no idea what you're just following what's on this. And, you know, something as simple as that. Right. And so that's what the, our adversaries are going to try to do. And so when you say, hey, we're training for this conventional threat and we're training for a, a near peer threat. Yes, but we're, we're training for a war we'd like to fight. We recognize, right, they have electronic warfare capabilities. But are we figuring out how to really disperse our staff or, or, you know, the UAS capability tied with, right, what they had in, in Donbass in eastern Ukraine, right, tying in UAS, on, on mar- air, un, unmanned aerial systems, right, with field artillery, right, so they can identify your, your command location, or they might not even have to get near you because they can do it remotely with electronic warfare capabilities because you're emanating this massive electromagnetic signature from your communications. And so we haven't thought about how do you either camouflage or deceive Right, use deceptions to hide those locations, but we still have these tops that are going to be relatively easy to find, and we're not fundamentally kind of changing how we fight based on the adversary's capability. So we kind of talk about A to AD, but if you go to a national training center, combat training center, and actually see how they're fighting, it, we're, we're fighting the way we want to fight, not fighting based on the adversary's capabilities, what I would argue. I would say uh, there's a couple of problems with how we approach the fight theoretically, too. I mean, if we are really going to prepare for more of an any fight anywhere, anytime, we have to accept that, like John was saying, these battlefields are not sterile um, and and units tend to not mass and surrender a sword when you defeat them. Like, that's just I don't know the last time a commander handed somebody a sword, but it's been a long fucking time. So we have what I would call poly or multi belligerent battlefields where. You know, the Chechens come in not because they're contracted to come in and, you know, they, they they join the fight for some reason. And you're not necessarily fighting against Al-Qaeda. Like maybe we're fighting against Al-Qaeda, but Al-Qaeda is competing for. And I always say this, that in, at least in terms of how I see modern combat, you know, the civil populace is the center of gravity. And if you're not competing for them and pushing them towards your objective, whatever it is, through affect, uh, you're going to lose because they are doing that. So when you have this multi-belligerent problem of different, different goals and we're focused on effects like how many missions, what's the broadcast capability of our radio, you know, how many people enrolled in bats and hides, we're losing every single time we focus on those things because we don't drive an affect. We only, try, we only measure an effect and it just, it doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of right goes to, what, you know, we use measures of performance, we call it, and measures of effect. Right, it's very easy to measure performance. Right, how how many patrols have we done in twenty four hours? Right, this was the old body count. Right during the Vietnam War, but measuring effectiveness is much harder. Right, and we we learn from our mistakes in Vietnam, and so we try to you know have all these you know matrix matrices and everything, and try to you know do a better you know do a better job in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. I think we did a better job. It's still nowhere close to where we have to be. 
and, and it, it's hard to measure. It takes much longer. And you got to know that from the onset. Um, but a lot of people, right, were learning on the job in Afghanistan and Iraq, and they shouldn't have had to be, right, if we were, you know, preparing people educationally in advance. I mean, this is one of the reasons we created the Modern War Institute, right, to get people thinking about these kind of things at, at various levels. But it's it's a much t- more complicated warfare, you know, but the way we like to fight is like the line on the map, like World War II, right? You can see this movement of the forces to Britain, right? Very easy to measure both measures of performance and measures of effectiveness, right? Is this line moving? Is it not? It's not that easy anymore, and it probably won't be that easy going forward. Hope you know, maybe maybe I'm wrong, and it will be. We'll get it. We'll get an easy war, but it, it's very it's it's much harder to assess that, right? Just look at Syria, right, and the various coalitions fighting down there. So yeah, much more challenging now. On, I know you and I really beat our heads about this um there is a hierarchy and you and you have to get people to understand the military way of thinking right there's a you know, at the highest level of any nation there's a certain number of scenarios in which they think are the highest risk to national security objectives and then you train your you build the military against that threat and you train it against that threat and that's why we see some really crazy decisions happening in the military today you know, whether it's the Marine Corps giving up their tanks, whether it's the U.S. military thinking that IEDs won't be a part of a future fight and developing vehicles that could be sliced open by IEDs that you and I know are, are familiar with. I mean, it's because we make these decisions on these likely highest risk scenarios that we want our society to fund, to build the military against these threats. The, argue, the problem is, is when, you know, I'm not in the room, we're not in the room when these war games are happening, but how can you realistically think that you know this or that aspect won't be a part of that political objective? You know the fact that there you know an urban area won't be a part of it. Where you know whether you're a follower of Jomini or you're a follower of Clausewitz or you know, whoever you think is your military theorist, that just the destruction of the enemy, likely in the open, will achieve your political outcome that you as a nation have gotten involved in. It, it's not the world we live in, but these are decisions that you know we pay people to make and they get argued all the way at the very top of the you know of the chain well you well above my chain um i just argue that there are other scenarios that we're seeing today and that's the problem is when every time you try to say well i build my military for 30 years from now 40 years from now because all the decisions about the next five ten years have already been made i'm building a military so i believe that you know, it'll be a, you know, artificial intelligence, robot driven, you know, battle with few U.S. casualties, with all kinds of assumptions on the destruction that can be done. I think it's leading to why we, you know, there's a really great book on America's first hundred battles, why we always lose the first battle, because somewhere in this thinking and this math and this future gazing, we get it wrong. But if you and I would put our hats on as any bad guy, any nation state even, and say, okay, how can I really mess up the Americans and their political objectives, if, whether it's in my country or somewhere else, I'm going to use every possible form of warfare that has ever been invented, everything from cyber non-attributional warfare to you know, coercing any group that I can to attack an interest of my enemy. This is all very common stuff. But for some reason, when we start to make these decisions about highest risk, most likely to threat to national security, we started getting all crazy. Like you and I, it's like, that's just crazy that you think that IEDs won't be a part of future fighting in whatever scenario you imagine, or you won't be doing it in a city. You'll be doing it, you know, out in some open area in the desert. You, you, you've heard me go off a, a bunch of times on this. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. You, you, you've heard me go off a, a bunch of times on this for sure without a doubt these these things were i mean instead of 
these most likely or, you know, most deadly courses of action, how about what are we not expecting? What would we do to us? You know, and those things, I mean, I'll tell you right now, like what made us uncomfortable for a while in Afghanistan, and this seems silly and it's not necessarily part of the combat thing, but when the, um, there was like an embargo on chips and chew and those things weren't getting in to the chow halls and PXs because we couldn't logistically push them. Wait, and, wait, 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 you had chow halls and PXs? In, in <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Not always where I was. Let, let's be clear on that. I, I, I was out there where there was no ice cream or anything, but but there, yeah, there was a time where we couldn't get chew and, and chips and that kind of thing. And it was driving people bananas. It's just a small thing. But that's how easy it is to start to unsettle, you know, what the Americans are and how we do it. You know, just attack our generators. I mean, how, how quickly would that fuck us up? If you just said, I don't care if you kill a single American soldier, but go go do your own, you know, destruction on any kind of generator and call it a day. You oh, know? God, yeah. I mean, generator went out when i was in afghanistan the tent would go from like 80 or whatever 70 degrees to like 100 plus i just would go out and do a run because i'm like i'm gonna be hot i might as well get something out of this <laughs> right i worked in a, a place where it was super it was so cold the generator would lock down and shut and the heaters could never make up the delta between outside and inside and so you were thankful when the air was coming out at 32 degrees because it was you know 30 degrees warmer than what was inside the tent and if you knock that capability out, and you know, it's not that hard to do, we would struggle as a military to be effective. We would, you know, we would find ways to deal with it and bring more generators in, but that's a fairly small thing that you could cause a lot of chaos with, especially on remote camps. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's right. It's what I was saying, you know, asymmetric, right? Figure out what, figure out what the capability is, but it's, it's not so much, I mean, that we can't anticipate it, right? I mean, again, just to, another example is, you know, in the, Early, you know, 2000s, the Marines had this, what they call a STAR report, System Threat Analysis Report, that basically said that, um, right, the, the modern, you know, the enemy is going to be, the most likely threat that, enemy, you know, vehicles are going to face is a combination of mines, ambushes employed on offensive, right, unconventional mine warfare, right? That's what the vehicles are going to face on this kind of, you know, push from the coast in. So they... The report said, hey, mines, which effectively IEDs are the number one threat, right? This report, you know, came out kind of before, you know, even Iraq, right? So real early 2000s. And what were the Marines pursuing, right? Vehicles that could be airlifted, right? And they're not a V-shaped hull, which for a lot, right, for physics and everything else, why it protects you from a blast. So they just ignored what their own analysis said the enemy would, what the most likely scenario would be. And just ignored that because it didn't fit their their vision of what warfare was, which was exped expeditionary fast, right? You can't be fast and productive, right? All the trade-offs. And so here it is, an assessment. This is the threat. We're going to ignore it and just because it doesn't fit our, our vision of how we want to fight. And so, right, you have and you have some of that, you know, I think still going on now. Uh, and then sometimes, right, sometimes it's not the military's fault, right? You got this massive military industrial complex, and the military is forced to buy vehicles and systems it just doesn't want um right eisenhower warned against it decades ago and i don't think much has changed so pete just one thing on, i mean anybody who wants to counter any of the thing we're talking about is going to say yeah got it um that's why we build adaptability in our force right so everything from down to the american soldier is the most adaptable leader you know, we're investing in leader development and that's the solution to future unpredictability and the same thing with you can they'll say it's about force structure about capabilities development um that you know we, we don't know what the future will hold we don't know what although we know what war looks like today um but they'll say that we're we have a built-in principle in our military about adaptability the soldier will adapt we will adapt our but i mean we all know like even what liam just said the industrial military complex can't adapt that if you close down tank and bradley factories they'll tell you that but if you ever need it again it doesn't just turn back on with a flip of the switch you've lost capability which is fine if we accept that that capability is gone and hard to to reacquire and then hard to master as well like 
it's just like uh, when you see a bunch of kids getting blown up in Syria and it's in the news and we're, we're gnashing our teeth and saying, oh, no, what are we ever going to do? We actually don't care because we're not going to go there and do anything significant about it. What would we do in the first place? But we like to throw our hands around and, and, and lose our minds. So the same thing with tanks. If, if we're going to be post-tank, you know, it means that you are going to lose some capability. Uh, but then you'll see the person who shows the picture of the Russians airdropping tanks into somewhere. And they say, see, we need airborne tanks. And, you know, the, the conversations get crazy. I, I want to... We've talked about the big stuff. Let's talk about on the ground because, again, I want to. I don't necessarily want to talk about American politics, but I want to get into the aspect of this is what combat combat is like right now today on the ground. And if you're looking forward to it, if you think somehow you're going to come out unscathed, you got another thing coming because you know it doesn't work like that. It's it's way worse than a pandemic. You know when when you've got people like all of a sudden half the people you know are gone. And come back if they come back, they're all torn up. So let's talk a little bit about the actual grisly nature of modern conflict. Yeah, so I mean, I'll turn. You know, spend a lot of time going back and forth to Ukraine. So I kind of talk about a little bit about what we're seeing, or you know, what we saw there in kind of the early stages of the conflict. And and you know, it was an interstate conflict, right? I mean, there were Russian forces in there. You know, not just leading the separatists, but actually Russian forces fighting the Ukrainian forces. And we saw the Russians, you know, also fighting the Georgians when they invaded Georgia back in 2008. So, you know, a little bit about what we're kind of seeing there. Right. And, and keep in mind, right, Ukraine was not a good military back in 2014. Uh, you know, not well trained, not well equipped, not necessarily well organized, in, but it's made a lot of progress. And it fought well and pushed, pushed the separatists to the borders and the Russians. You know, that's when they kind of sent their... Uh, tanks and everything else across the border, which, of course, they denied. You know, I always use the example, you know, the Russians denied it. They said, hey, we can't help what people do when they go on, you know, when they go on leave, as we call it in the military. And I'm like, yeah, you know, we take block leave. Everybody kind of goes on vacation at the same time. But when I was, you know, I wouldn't take leave with my entire company <laughs> and take our tanks into Canada with us. Right. That's just not how it works. It's not plausible. Right. But what, you know, what did you see there, you know, as an example, right? You know, identifying the Ukrainian position with right unmanned aerial systems, right? The drones, whatever you want to call them, flying in the air, right? Identifying those positions and then within, you know, 10 minutes dropping, you know, artillery on it and decimating a battalion, you know, down to below 50 percent, you know, on one occasion. Um, right. Or, you know, look at identify them through electronic warfare methods. Right. Or, right. Too many people are carrying these. Right. Recognizing the vulnerability of these. But so dependent on, on that. But that's what they're carrying into combat using for communications uh, and the Russians exploiting that capability. Right. Either for what, you know, we call, uh, you know, pinpoint propaganda. Right. Sending messages down to the soldiers saying, hey, uh, artillery strike is coming. You know, go, you know, go home. It's not worth, you know, dying for a corrupt oligarch. Right. And then dropping artillery on. Them, right. And, 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 and combining like we haven't seen before. Right. That kind of cyber and electronic combined with kinetic you know, measures all in one to have, have an effect and, and seeing those kind of things. And so, and that's what, you know, example of what you're seeing out there. And if you say, okay, it's the Ukrainians, right. We, we would do much better than that. Um, yeah. In some ways, right. We have some capabilities, but I would still argue who, right. We, we kind of, even if we're superior on the ground level, we have really good air defense systems, right. What about that canopy level? What, what about from 20 meters to 50 meters? Right. What do we have? And, you know, I've argued multiple times, like unmanned aerial systems. Right. It's not even a battle drill for an infantry platoon right, or infantry squad of what you do when you see an unmanned air, air, you know, aerial system. Right. As opposed to a ranger handbook. Right. You have all these things. I still know from back in, you know, 1993, going through ranger school, exactly how far in front of a fast moving aircraft I shoot, whether it's going from you know left to right or straight on. Yes. Or the helicopter, right. Right. I'm going to aim 50 feet in front of the helicopter, 100 feet in front of a you know, fixed wing, 200 feet if it's fast moving. And if just below the nose, if it's coming at me. But I have no idea. The Army hasn't told me at all what to do if I see a you know, drone up in the sky. Do I shoot it? Do I hide? Do I drop smoke and break contact? Treat it like, you know, because you have to assume that if that thing is up in the air, you have to assume that it sees you. Right. Either visually through a thermal signature right? Or through an electromagnetic signature, it sees you 
and the artillery is going to come in. And so you've got to get out of there because the artillery is going to come in not far behind, right? If you have a talk, right, and this thing is up in the air, right, the battle drill should just be to leave everything, pull your computers, leave those tents and everything behind and get the hell out of there, right? But you won't see people jump in talks, at, you know, like I said, at the National Training Centers. And when I've asked, you know, the people who run them why they don't, and they said, well, you know, they, well, what training would they get out of there if you killed the entire battalion leadership? I go, that's exactly the training they get, right? You take them out for 24 hours, right? They're going to learn their lesson. And so that kind of gives you a, a kind of a, you know, indicator of what things might be. Now, some have described kind of the current um, situation in Ukraine as kind of World War I with, you know, modern information measures and drones and, and 21st century technology. Yes, it's static, but it's only static because you have right, the Minsk agreement, and it's kind of a tenuous ceasefire. If the ceasefire lifted, it would be back to maneuver warfare there. But I mean, that gives you a a sense of what it looks like over there. What do casualty counts look like when we're dealing with this kind of thing? I mean, you know, in general, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, you know, it was a person a day, sometimes a little more than that, but it wasn't catastrophic. It It certainly wasn't Saipan or any of these other big battles where we lost thousands of people in a month. So what is it like there in terms of fatalities? Yeah, so, I mean, really, most of the fighting was done in the first few months of 2014, right? As the separatists kind of, right, declared their independence, the Ukrainians, like I said, they kind of moved east, pushed on the borders, and the Russians came back. So most of the fighting occurred and the deaths, though, you know, any given week, right? There's, there's, like I said, it's a tenuous ceasefire. There's always, you know, deaths from snipers, IEDs, occasional artillery. Um, but... What did the Ukrainians, what have they lost to date with the bulk of these really being in a six month period? They lost about 4,000 of their armed forces, right? Okay, so put that in perspective, right? That's close to what we lost in Iraq during the entire time in Iraq, right? And just, and that was over an extended period of time. And what's the population of Ukraine, right? Population is basically California. So that's California, right? Losing, right? Accounting for all the losses in the Iraq war over a six month period, right? So pretty significant. And why? Because, right, artillery was back to being a significant, um, right, inflicting a lot of casualties. Why? Because we focused on precision guided munitions, right, for a lot of reasons. One of the ch- one of the problems with them is they're very expensive, right? The Russians have instead invested in, like, MLRS, multiple launch rocket systems, right? They're just massing fires, so they don't have to be as precise, right? You can have you know, I don't know the exact dollar, right, cost, but let's say you could fire 50 rounds for the price of one PG, you know, prison guide ammunition, right? And so if this UAV up in the air, or UAS up in the air sees you, it doesn't even have to get your exact grid coordinates. And even if you start running, they're just going to say, hey, we'll just take out a 500, right, meter cir- radius circle from, from this spot. No one it's going to hit you because we don't even have to be that accurate. We're just going to drop massive fires on. So casualties can be right are going to be higher when you have those kind of things. By the way, looking at the uh, the Corona casualty count here in in uh, California, and it is currently just under thirteen thousand people, two twelve thousand nine hundred. And and again, that's just the number that's put out there. We're not trying to decide that those numbers are accurate, but just to give you a frame on on what this looks like in terms of combat deaths versus this uh, this pandemic. Um, modern combat, I guess, isn't full of a lot of, of like, we've really crushed the numbers down in terms of what happens. I mean, if you doubled that to 8,000 in that time frame, it still wouldn't be as big as a lot of month-long battles that we've seen in past history. Has combat gotten safer? Uh, I, uh, I'll let John answer this one. I, 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 often, I often wonder, I always think about you know, what would be like the worst period of time to fight a conflict, right? And you can constantly pick like, man, this war would suck. That war would suck. I I mean, I got to think the trenches would have really sucked, especially if you're just, you know, especially if you're not just sitting in the trenches and they want you to fight across no man's land and they haven't kind of figured out artillery, communications, right? All these innovations, you know, stormtroop tactics that they eventually figured out by 1917. But early on, like that, that would have sucked. And you think, well, World War II kind of would have sucked, you know, fighting with the freaking artillery coming in and just getting shelled that way. And you're like, that would have sucked too. And then you're like, okay, but at least you can fight an enemy. And then now, like you were saying kind of earlier on, well, Iraq would have sucked because at least you knew where the enemy kind of was there. It's like, you could just be driving anytime and hit an IED, right? No control over that. And you can't stop and search every culvert 
or every suspicious looking thing. I mean, you know, for people that haven't been over there, it's not pristine and curbs and everything no. else, right? They they can put that thing anywhere and you can't tell because there's disturbed ground everywhere, right? And so I, it's definitely not, not any safer. I would argue it's more dangerous, you know, than ever again, like I said, just because of the fact that, right, the, polar, the democratization of violence and technology, any, right, anybody can get this drone ordered on Amazon or something, probably get it delivered. And at least at that small level, right, there's a threat. And the army hasn't told me how to prepare for this UAS. It's in the air that's going to freaking just fly in and detonate on us. Right. And so the last thing, the thing I'm left with is kind of left with, Hey, okay, I'm up a tune. Well, one person's constantly just got to be scanning the air because I, I don't know what else to do. And then when it comes, I don't know, maybe we shoot it. I don't know. Right. So I, I think it's, you know, probably scarier now than, and it's been though. I mean, like I said, World War One, you know, you start dropping mustard gas and stuff. I mean, it's pretty creepy. John. Yeah. So I love the topic. Um, you, we could do a whole show on this, on these myths we have about war. Uh, it's no more safer than it was a hundred years ago. I mean, war is not safe. Um, a bullet still penetrates. A, an RPG still slices through metal. Um, and some realization of how basic uh, and lethal war is. And that's why this democratization, depending on where you're going, and anybody can do it. Anybody can pick up a rifle and join the fight and be a threat. Um, so it gets and to that. I was going to say, we haven't talked about, you know, urban really, but I mean, yeah. just fighting that environment now, is, I mean, John can talk more about it, but it, right, it's massive, right? And before it was just urban was different, right? You weren't talking massive structures like it is now. Yeah, I mean, it's casualty aversion, such an amazing topic. Like you said, you, I can quote you the, the just the US based coronavirus, you know, 150,000. Um, political will in war is is as important today as it was when war started. And, and to think that there's some military that doesn't have to account for the, the political will or the their, their home population's will to continue to fight. I mean, Vietnam, we're losing a thousand people a day, a day, um, yeah. a day. Um, would we have done that after 9-11 in, in Iraq or, or in Afghanistan? Let's say in Afghanistan, would we, as an American population, had the will to say that that is acceptable in our, in our belief on why we are fighting? If you talk about the, the percentage of Americans that actually fight the wars that are agreed to as sending troops to, you know, the 1% versus the 99%. Um, but we still have this American casualty aversion where, you know, and the, this gets to the modern war where every single death can not only be reported, but can be filmed. And I can show you what happened in that situation where you talk about those first six months in Ukraine, you had entire companies being erased off the map by artillery fire. That's something that the American soldier hasn't faced in a very long time. And would the American population say, would continue with that operation? Can we think of a scenario, some national threat that is going to be okay? I mean, war is not going to get any safer. And, and despite the investments in force protection, like we pointed out, I mean, I can, I mean, with an explosive form penetrator IED, I can still penetrate most American armor unless you got unless you're in a tank. Um, despite what people think about the MRAPs, so it's, it's this casualty aversion that we have in war, based on the last twenty years, should not be carried forward. And I don't think it is in the war games. But if I go to like these national training centers and where he says, okay, I can't just eliminate my entire brigade command structure. That that's not a good training value. Well, that could be the war you're going to face because that's just, <coughs> that's historical. That's modern warfare. I mean, that, that happened in Baghdad. I, I just watched the attack of Baghdad and I didn't realize that while they're in the city, the, the brigade CP gets attacked. And they had a Ford tack, but the tack got it eliminated by a rocket attack. I didn't know that. And sometimes we just don't understand these aspects of the most recent conflicts we've been in. But that's a huge topic for me, this, this casualty aversion and 
if you can report something in real time, so uh, General Scales is really great. I don't know if you've read any of his books, but the way warfare is today, you you're not you can't expect a military to be fighting a war and not have everybody watching. Where wars in the future will be more like entering a sports arena, and you can assume there'll be some amount of visibility on every action taken, every death. So you know when we see an entire unit wiped off the map, that and I think our enemies are accounting on that will change something. And they may think they have the better political will to fight than we do. But even if you look at the wars in Chechnya, the, you know everybody likes to, to tell me that Russians have a less casualty aversion. That's not true. I mean, even when they attack, because I'm urban warfare, right? So they, the first battle of Chechnya, it was a huge issue that they were losing troops back in, mother, in the motherland, in Russia, to, and they had to stop what they were doing. Yeah, and, and Russian moms don't like their kids coming home in body bags any more than American or Western moms. And the only thing I kind of add on what John's saying about casualty inversion, right? It's not just the American public, right? We in the military, because of our success, I think, really in the Gulf War, uh, have created this false sense of how you fight. And, and, and it, you know, that people go to combat or expect to go to combat and think they're not going to lose anybody, right? And, 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 and I think that's... It, it sets up long term, right? You know, I don't think that helps with PTSD either, right? If you don't go in with the expectation like that, but right, I think we we, we have this false sense. Like, think of it as a triangle, right? We think we can minimize collateral damage, right? We don't want to level city blocks. We can minimize civilian casualties, and we're not going to suffer any casualties ourselves, right? You can't fight that way, right? One of them's got to give, right? It's almost like, hey, if I'm going to assume more risk to minimize collateral damage and civilian casualties, which is what you want to do in war, right? You're, you might not come home with everybody or right in the urban environment, we're going to, okay, no, we're going to level the city block because we want to protect the force more, but then you got to, right. It, but we, we've created this false sense where you can, you can, you can accomplish everything, right? No civilian casualties, no collateral damage and, you know, really minimal risk of force or you're not going to take any casualties and it's not realistic. It never has been realistic in war other than a Gulf War in the desert. Uh, but historically in war, war, you're going to fight. And then, I, you know, but know that going in that you're going to lose four or five or 10,000 people and it might affect the calculus to go in in the first place. John, anything in closing? No, I mean, I think this is a great topic. And again, this is why we stored up the Modern War Institute is to better understand modern war and to have ready available information because I think we've hit on that. If more people knew this, maybe they'd change the way they train, change the way they think. Um, how do you enable people to get that type of information at the point of need? Liam, in closing, what do you want to say? No, I mean, right, I'm overly critical probably, right, because that's your, you know, where I came from, right? And we, we can demand better. That's not to say don't take my comments that the military is doing a terrible job because it's not, but we can always do better, right? And that's what we should be striving for. And there's lessons that can be learned out there, right? We just have to go and do it and do the hard stuff, right? Technology is only part of the solution. A lot of the solutions are just really simple, right? Training, tactics, doctrine, but those ones are actually the hardest to implement because it goes against human nature. But guess what? That's how you got to train. Just like when I was in Germany, right? We trained with our protective masks on almost all the time. Well, one, we were in old German buildings. We didn't trust what was in them, but right (laughs) We could fight in the hardest scenario. Therefore, when you took the mask off and you're fighting, it was easy, right? And so practice the harder scenario. And then when you don't have to worry about it, it's easy. Yeah. I guess the last thing I'll say is you're right about that. We got into a firefight one time in Iraq where it was really sandy and dusty. And within 20 seconds, you couldn't see shit because there was so much dust in the sky. And it was just like, get low you know shoot sparingly if you had something inside but it was impossible like it was just you weren't going to reliably hit anything and or control the enemy and vice versa so you're right those environments make it even tougher once you're there and it's really hard to simulate all of the things that could happen to you on the battlefield thank you fellas so much for coming in um, let's do more of this stuff let's just expand these conversations because we could have done this completely differently if we just started again right now and i, I know that uh, there's plenty of folks out there that are interested in this kind of topic 